We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We're going to be picking up in verse 10 today. We are in the middle of the context of this passage, which is love of God, love of people, love of ministry, and partnership. So love of God, love of people, love of ministry, and partnership. Today, the overarching uh, section we're going to be going through deals with principles of giving, principles of giving. And you could actually carry that theme uh, into chapter 9. There's a lot of doctrine here that's worthy of for our exploration and understanding so that we would understand the Word of God and live its principles. And I'm excited about today's message uh, as we look at God being our provider and the principles that we understand in giving. Second Corinthians chapter 8, by the way, I'm wearing this because it was a part of the wedding and I was telling a couple of our ladies, anything that draws your attention there is better. Okay, so that's what that's about. Second Corinthians chapter 8, we're in uh, this first few verses, 10 through 12, uh, we're going to be looking at provision, provision. God provides, and isn't it true that God provides for you? Isn't it true that God meets your needs where you are? And it doesn't mean that there's no longer any need in our lives, but he meets our needs where we are with what he has for us. And we begin here in verse 10, Proverbs 8, 10, where we read, and herein I give my advice. Paul is encouraging the Corinthians to follow through with a commitment to help uh, the Jerusalem church and as the Macedonian churches had already done. And he's going to give them advice in this, and he says, for this is expedient for you, who have begun before not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. This was your plan. You initiated this plan. Now, therefore, perform the doing of it. That as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which ye have. For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. When he says in this first part of verse 10, it is expedient, when he gives his advice, he is simply trying to be helpful to them. Now, I think just a personal note here, what we recognize in both bad doctrine and maliciousness under the name of God, that there are many that would make use of God's people for money. Uh, there are many that would seek to manipulate God's people for money. And let's just all understand and be clear again that the motivation for any giving that we have has to come from your walk with God and your fellowship with God and he's, as he guides your heart. I think there should be a natural drawing back when you sense man's manipulation of God's people. It's God who motivates, God who directs. But in this, he says, I'm giving this advice because it's expedient. Now, let's just give that word's definition. Expedience means profitable or beneficial. The idea is that I'm giving this advice because it's going to be beneficial or profitable for you. Now, it doesn't dive far into this doctrine, but there is a principle in Scripture that we have the material goods that we have in life and the ability that we have with those material goods to lay up treasure in heaven. I'll admit there's mystery in some of that. that We don't know how all that works out. But the Bible even teaches that a cup of water given in his name has blessing and treasure or reward with it. And so God is mindful of those things. God's mindful of our material goods. But God gives us the opportunity to lay up treasure in heaven. And I, th I believe that's why Paul says this is helpful for you. So that's that begins the, uh, the exhortation or the advice that he gives. But he goes from here and he says, there needs to be a performance of that which you have been willing to do. This is much like what you would read in James chapter 2. And if you want to turn there, you can. Just going to read two verses. But I'm going to read this verse and then I'm going to go to James. Again, verse 10, here and I give my advice for this is expedient for you who have begun before not only to do but also to be forward a year ago. And then he says, now therefore perform the doing of it. Perform the doing of it. And in this, we're looking at James chapter 2. And here's the idea. The idea is that we take our actualization of ministry beyond our speech. Verse 15 of James chapter 2. You have these two verses, which you read out loud with me? James 2, 15 and 16. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, 
And one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, and be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? What's the answer to that? What's the answer to that question? What does it profit? Nothing. So in here you have a platitude of words. You have this uh, mental assent to need or this uh, uh, mental uh, acknowledgement of need, but no engagement in it. He says, one of you says, depart in peace, be you warmed and filled. And that leaves the person who's in that need with this question, how? How, how are you proposing that I do that? And it's just kind of the nod and, and the smile and the move on without actually engaging. And what we're simply deal, dealing with at the beginning of this is God is the one who provides, but he provides beyond our speech, beyond our acknowledgement. Giving is done in this passage, as we read in verse 11, back to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 11. Giving is done out of that which ye have. God is the one that supplies our needs. He is the one to whom we all should give thanks for the provisions that we have. And we come back to this same theme throughout this chapter. Everything that we have, we have of God. And one principle that we've already drawn out in this passage is we give out of what God has given us. So that's in verse 12. For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. I'm not going to take time to go into it again. And I want to be fair. You're only hearing from me one side of this. You're hearing my landing result of what has often been given under the banner of faith promise giving. And faith promise giving, we've mentioned this before. There is a way, I think, to do faith promise giving correctly. But if you're not familiar with faith promise giving, it often looks like this. This is a church trying to figure out what they're going to give their missionaries and set up a budget for the year to come. So they will often set out uh, cards to their people and ask their people to fill out cards how much they intend to give. And then they base their budget on that giving dollar or giving amount. The problem I have with that is this passage or passages like this. Should churches walk in faith? The answer is yes. Should the church corporate body exercise itself in faith? Yes. Just like the individual members of the body exercise faith in giving. But our giving has to come out of what God has provided. We don't promise to give out of what we don't have. And that's the problem I have. Now, I will say this, and let me give a, a positive side of what I would call faith giving. I'm going to leave the word promise out of it. The reason, again, I don't like the promise is because I believe the passages are pretty clear that we're to give out of what God gave us, not what we expect to give. However, I have seen believers in faith promise exercise this kind of methodology. Lord, I would like to give this amount. And Lord, if you give that amount to me, I'm going to trust you for it. But if you give it, that's what I'm going to give. And in faith, they step out and they look to God to provide that. And they give out of that determination between them and God, but under the same principle as God provided. Now, here's the short of all of that. It's God that gives us anything to be able to give at all. Now, I actually cut out a lot of different passages I was going to include here because they're going to come up in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. So we'll get there. But I want you to know this, that you and I are blessed with God's provision every day. And one of the things that I think that we live in a lie about is that we will get to the place where there is no longer need. And the truth is, um, I think God made us to need him. God made us to be dependent upon him. God made us and I think wants us to live with that continual to looking to him and giving thanks to him for how he is meeting our needs daily. So we start with this first part of the passion, uh, uh, passage with provision that we are simply giving and it's beneficial to us. 
uh, God blesses this. Uh, God blesses his people when they have a spirit of a willing and giving heart. But he says, this is beneficial for you. And he's simply calling them to the place of now engage with what you said you were going to do and do it out of what God has given. What you're really sensing here is this next P in this series, uh, at least this message today. God is the one who provides for you, but there is a partnership that we have one with another. And let me, let me give a couple of principles before I get into the partnership. One of the things that I want to encourage you about with Fellowship Baptist Church is you folks are a giving people. And I get to be the communicator, the communicator of your giving often. I get to be the one who gives a check to a visiting missionary or an evangelist or someone who's coming through, and I give them what you have given to the church. I turn around and I give that check to them. And it's going to come up in 2 Corinthians 9, but what happens again and again is their overwhelming gratitude for how you stepped in sacrificially to be a blessing to them. That partnership is what we're going to look at further in this passage. But I just want to underscore this fact. I believe that God always wants Fellowship Baptist Church to have a giving spirit. I believe that God has blessed fellowship because we've had that spirit. Throughout our history from the very beginning of the church, uh, we've had this principle in mind and we've given opportunity to uh, engage in these partnerships and God has continually blessed and blessed and blessed. So I'm going to give you a quick relayed story to that. And that is, I remember we were a pretty young church. There was an evangelist who had a need and we had an opportunity because we had uh, some resource within the church we had an opportunity to give $10,000 to them buying a trailer so that they could be uh, on the road, giving the gospel, doing the work of the ministry. So we said that before our people. Uh, we made a decision to do so. We gave it. And I just want to relay this in testimony to just what God does. Uh, you know, we knew that as a younger church, that would be a significant gift from our church. But I, I stand on the other side of that with one month later, one month later, if you looked at our books, as far as what we had in our accounts, you would never know that we gave the $10,000. Why? Just because God does what God does. And, and nobody can take any credit for anything except for look what God does. Now, I want to drape that down to your life. Do you have need? Yes. Everybody does. But I want you to remember that God is your provider, that God cares for you, that he looks out for you, that he looks to meet your needs. And even in that need, it is a good and healthy thing for you and I to reach out with our hands, to hold God's hand and say, Lord, I need your help. He is the provider. But in that provision, God has given us an opportunity in partnership. And so we look at verses 13 forward here. Back in 2 Corinthians 8, 13 and forward. 13 through 15. For I mean not that other men be eased and ye be burdened, but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want. He's talking about the Jerusalem church who is under famine and under persecution as we understand it. And in their need, there was an opportunity to engage in ministry to help them in their physical and ministerial need. He says in verse 14 again, but by an equality that now at this time, your abundance may be a supply for their want, their need. That their abundance also may be a supply for your want or need. There, that there may be an equality. As it is written, he that had gathered much had nothing over, and he that had gathered little had no lack. Here is the principle. Now, to be sure, the Bible is not speaking of some type of uh, social uh, equitable justice where, or even reparations or things like that. And we're going to come into, into that in this passage. He's talking about the opportunity to be partners in burden sharing. 
that we reach out one to the other to meet one another's needs as God directs. So this passage would be seen, or at least counterbalanced by 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So turn there for a moment. We're going to be in several passages to lay out the case and understanding for the doctrine in this passage. He's not talking about socialism. He's not talking about communism. This is under the banner of meeting needs. So here's the point. The church is to engage beyond the verbal acknowledgement of need. We are to do what we can in stepping in to meet other people's needs. And, and, and you're going to hear it again and again. We can't do it all, but we can do what we can. And that's the principle. We are driven by God's provision as he motivates us through scripture to partner where we can to do what we can. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 23 through 25, and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. Verse 24 talk, is really talking here about the body of Christ, how it works together. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no what? Schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. What's the idea here? That we care about the body of Christ. We care about our brothers and sisters in the Lord. We care about people. And in that caring for people, we step in without regard to rank, without regard to position. We step in as God motivates and as God leads to engage to help a brother or sister who has need. This also goes into helping those who are outside of the gospel, that we would minister the love of Christ and make wise use of mammon, the, the material goods that we have in this world, to help people know the love of God, to be an entrance to speaking the gospel to those who don't know Christ. Take your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. So how do we know that these passages aren't talking about, hey, let's, let's make sure that everybody makes the same amount of money. Let's make sure everybody has the same amount of stuff, the same kind of stuff in their houses, the same material goods. How do we know this? Well, there's the principle of our own stewardship in being what God has called us to be, to be, to not only provide for our own needs, but to meet the needs of others. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 through 13. The partnership that we see here is that there is an individual responsibility to work. Now we command you, brethren, in verse 6, 2 Thessalonians 3, we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the, tra the tradition which he received of us. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. He's going to give the definition of what this looked like in the next verses. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you, not because we have not power or the right or the authority. He's talking about receiving wages or love offering or a gift. He says, not that we don't have that right or authority to ask that, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. For even hereunto, uh, for even when we were with you, this we commanded. This we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you, and here's that again, word, disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they should what? They should work and eat their own bread. Now, the point is simply a counterbalance to the idea that this passage that we have in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 13 through 15, is not socialism. This is burden sharing. This is seeing someone have need or seeing ministry have need and looking at what we have and asking God, what do you want me to do? 
And sometimes you can't do anything. Sometimes you don't have the leading of the Lord that that's what you ought to do. But the one who compels at all is God. And the reason we have anything to give at all is because of God. Amen? Now, that's the principle. Now, don't, don't get lost here. I notice the quietness in the, in the room, and we're talking about money. And there may be some here that would be saying, see, this, why don't, I don't go to church. It's all about money. Well, the truth is, money is part of how we worship God because we would have nothing if it wasn't from him. The fact that we have any, some of you might, some of you might, um, disparage the fact that the church uh, has offerings that are given. We just take a moment to say, I'm going to go back to it. Even at the time of COVID, we held a time in our service when it was me and someone at the sound booth and my family, we had a time where we had an offertory. And it was five, six, seven people here. Why did we do that? Because I believe it's right for God's people to remember that God is your provider. And that we have reason to give thanks. I have to admit to some griping in my own life. So I, I, I would love to say I was only tempted but I think I actually carried out some griping this week. And here's why. I had to take one of my vehicles into the auto shop. Can you feel my pain? <laughs> and I had to put out some money. And I was talking about to one of my kids. And I actually felt convicted about it later. Uh, in the same conversation, I found myself... Um, griping about how much I had to put out. But then the Holy Spirit got a hold of me and here's what I was able to follow that up with. And praise God, there was money there to pay for it. Right? And you'd say, but I've got a need and it's not covered. Right? If it's ever going to get covered at all, who's going to do it? God's going to do it. Now, the principles of Scripture that he'll do it through your work. He'll do it through your ability. But he'll also do it through your inability. Right? The truth is, you could have something happen to you today that would financially be devastating to everything that you have. What would it take? Well, a good visit to the hospital might do it. A diagnosis might do it. What's the tendency? The tendency is, oh, what am I going to do? And, oh, how's it? And, and, and you and I can worry and worry and worry and worry. And I'm going to give you that age-old advice that comes from Scripture. But put in my language, stop it. We are dependent upon God to provide for us. We do not have endless resource in ourselves. Matter of fact, we have limited resource. But in that limited resource, everything that we have, we have from God, and we are stewards of that, and we get to do something with it. We get to partner as God provides. Would you take your Bibles? to Ephesians 4, I'll admit to this not being in the notes. But I'm sharing it with you because it's something we teach our kids. When they get a job and start working or they get resource, this is what we walk through with them in Ephesians 4. We give a principle out of verse 28. We've memorized as a family Ephesians 4, 25 through 32. But in this is verse 28. It says, let him that stole steal no more. Are you saying your kids are stealing? Well, I hope they're not, but that's not the point. It says, this what people who before when they weren't saved, uh, this may have been what they had done, but don't do this. Instead, rather let him labor working with his hands 
the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. One of the things that we teach our young people, and it often starts with working for camp. I will tell them that, you know, God will provide for you. You do what you can, trust him. But I want to challenge you with something else. Don't look just to meet your needs. Maybe God will give you a situation where you will be able to meet somebody else's need. And this is part of why God gives us work, not just to meet our own needs, but to meet the needs of others. Here's the point. Partnership in Scripture, or I should say it this way, partnership is in Scripture. It is a biblical thing that we bear one another's burdens, that we help one another with the cause of Christ and in their need. So that partnership is underscored in these passages. Would you look at Galatians chapter 6? Galatians chapter 6. The principle in 2 Corinthians 8 is that we love and care for one another in times of need. That's the equality. That's the equality that we share. That we love and care for one another in times of need. Galatians 6 is talking about sin and how we step in to love and care for one another. But listen to Galatians 6, 1 through 5. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Here's a principle. Bear ye one another's burdens. What is that born out of? What is bearing one another's burdens born out of? Love, caring for people because God loves you. Remember 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9? Who was the motivating factor? Look at Jesus. It says, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. So God gives you the grace to bear the burdens that you have, but he also gives us the opportunity to partner with others to bear their burdens. And here's the thing. Christians, God did not just call us to an ideology that's in our heads. He called us to engage in ministry. We do what we, can, what we can out of what God has, has given. This is a personal decision between you and God. But that we can do anything at all is a testimony of God's love and provision to you. Now, there's a picture in all of this. So go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We're going to be diving into the Old Testament here in a second as well. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 15, you read this. As it is written, he that had gathered much had nothing over. And he that had gathered little had no lack. What is that referencing? What's it referencing? If you know it, say it a little louder. Manna. Where's that found? Take your Bible to Exodus chapter 16. Exodus chapter 16. So we've looked at provision, partnership, and in this, there is a picture. So we're going to spend the rest of our time looking at this picture. Exodus chapter 16. Exodus 16, we're going to read, well, I'll just, I'm not going to tell you. Here we go. Okay. Exodus 16. And they took their journey from Elam and all the congregation of the children of Israel came unto the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. The whole congregation of the, of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Why? And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. When we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full, for you have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with what? And it's no fun to be hungry. The longer I preach, the less friendly you'll be. (laughs) 
Then said the Lord unto them. I right, said, Lord unto Moses. All right. Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. The people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. And Moses and Aaron said unto all the children of Israel at even, then you shall know that the Lord hath brought you out from the land of Egypt. And in the morning then you shall see the glory of the Lord, for that he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. And what are we that you murmur against us? And Moses said, this shall be, when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, for that the Lord heareth your murmurings, which ye murmur against him, and what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against who? The Lord. Now, time out. We like to look at Israel and look and look at what they did in complaining. Do we ever complain? Do you ever complain about our needs and our lack? And Moses spake unto Aaron, say unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, come near before the Lord, for he hath heard your murmurings. They came to pass as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I have heard the murmurings, getting the idea that the Lord is paying attention to their murmurings. I've heard the murmurings of the children of Israel speak unto them, saying, And even ye shall eat flesh, and in the morning ye shall be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. And it came to pass that at even the quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay round about the host. And when the dew that lay was, on, was, was gone up, Behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoarfrost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna, for they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. Gather of it every man according to his eating. And Omer for every man according to the number of your persons. Take ye every man for them which are in his tents. And the children of Israel did so and gathered some more and some less. And when they did meet it with an omer, he that gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. They gathered every man according to his eating. This passage, you could read further, but this passage relays what is qualified as a miracle of God. When God provides this manna, what does the word manna mean? Manna, the word, literally means what is it? That's what it means. So when we read manna, that was the understanding of the word. What is it? Because they had never seen it before. In this situation, God's people are desperate. There is a pain in their situation. They are literally hungry. They do have need. But in this, you have an illustration of Jesus Christ and salvation. In their desperation, they were unable to provide for themselves. There was nothing they could do. And God magnified their pain and their hunger to magnify their need. And since it's interesting to me that the gospel presentation is very similar to what you find in the New Testament with Jesus being on earth, because in their desperation, instead of looking to the Lord for help, their knee-jerk response is to accuse him. Their knee-jerk response is to react in fear and to react in anger. And instead of looking to God for help, they do the exact opposite and they're angry at God, they're angry at Moses, and they provide a reason for God's motivation that God would not own, 
You did this, Lord, to bring us out into the wilderness simply to kill us. And the point is that when desperation comes and when trial comes, our tendency is in our carnality to accuse God of what he is not. And to malign his character in our fear to act foolishly. You are not going to live on this planet without need. You're going to experience it. And I'm challenging you to make a choice now to know that God is the provider. He is the one that meets your needs. He is the one to whom to look. And in that time of desperation, be careful not to murmur against the God of heaven who is better than you know. In this illustration, which is a real life happening, in their murmuring, he does what Jesus does in the New Testament. He provided for them anyway. He did for them what they did not deserve. Now, how stubborn were they in this? God gave very specific illustrations or commands about how they were to do it, when they were to get it, and when they were not to, and they broke it at every turn. And God, at the end of that, you know, would God have been justified at their disobedience after he provides manna and he says to go gather it, and then he gave specific instructions and one not to gather it, they do it anyway, would God have been justified to say, okay, I gave you a chance, showed you what I could do, you disobeyed, we're done. But he didn't. He kept providing. God is providing for the planet today. There are people eating food today that God gave. People drawing breath because God gave it. And why does God give it? That we might know him. That we might come to him. The illustration in provision and the great illustration that is bound in need is that God is the provider to meet your need and you've got more need than you know. But the greatest need you have on the planet is a savior. So this manna in Exodus chapter 16 represents our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He is the bread of heaven. Take your Bibles to John chapter 6. Paul, challenging the Corinthian believers, says, take what you've spoken and turn your speech into deed. There are others who have need, and in this principle of giving, give out of what I've given you, and partner with others who have need, that there be a provision of burden sharing one with another, because I'm the provider, and I'm the one who meets your needs, and consider for a moment how I meet your need. This passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 where you read this Old Testament reference is magnifying that God is the provider who gives us the ability at all to step in and burden share and help others out of the love of Christ. But the picture is greater than material good. In John chapter 6 we read the bread of heaven in verse 22 about the bread of heaven John 6, the day following when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there save the one uh, whereunto his disciples were entered and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone. Howbeit, howbeit there came other boats from Tiberias nigh unto the place where they did eat bread. After that, the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, Neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? 
Jesus answered it and answers them with an insight that God has into the heart of man. Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Why did they come? Why did they come? They came for the food. Now, by the way, we recognize that. That's why we have a food fellowship Sunday. Did you know? Did you know that God ordained in scriptures? He says that believers gather together and they eat together. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Fried chicken. Every, I often like the way they say, I love the way they, uh, they say on a food fellowship Sunday or a potluck Sunday, when Baptists are concerned, every chicken in the valley should be afraid. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Amen. It's not wrong to come for the food, but there's more involved. There are greater needs in food. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto what? Everlasting life? What are you talking about? They begin to wonder. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. They said unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? They give him some kind of spiritual mumbo jumbo. Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God. You want to know what the work of God is? That you believe on him whom he hath sent. They said unto him, therefore unto him, what sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? Now, wait a second. What had he just done? He had fed the multitudes out of the loaves and out of the fish. He had fed the multitudes and they said, ah, you know what he's doing? He's looking into the manipulative heart of man. And that same heart of man is still here and possibly pre present in this room that says, I will not believe you unless you do what I want you to do. You're not really God unless you do it the way I want you to do it. Praise God, there is one God of heaven. But in his grace, just like the manna in Exodus 16, in their murmurings, in their rebellion, he provides anyway. They say in verse 31, our fathers, you get that, you, they start tipping their hand to show what's really in their heart. Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. As is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. You getting the hint, Jesus? You getting the hint? Now, I don't know that this is so. Jesus already revealed that they came for the food. But now they reference manna for heaven. And here's what I, I'm wondering. I'm wondering if they want Jesus to give them that same manna that was given to their forefathers years and years, thousands of years ago. That same manna that at some point in their history, their forefathers began to despise. And here's the theme. We put God in a position of nothing is good enough because I want to be God. We live in that generation now. I want what I want. You give me what, what I want. And if you don't, I'm going to, today you got to worry any more about violence and revolt. You've been hearing it. We got a generation now, it's been in Chicago, it's been Baltimore, teenagers going out just wreaking uh, mayhem and violence because really what they're saying in society is that there's this entitlement that I get what I want when I want it. You know what that leads to? Dissatisfaction because you don't always get what you want when you want it. It's a false dream. They just want another miraculous meal is what it looks like. Jesus says unto them, verse 32, Very verily I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. The, for the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven 
and giveth life unto the world. They said unto him, and they're still, they still are thinking materially, Lord, evermore give us this bread. The Lord has magnified their need and allowed their testimony to come forth so that he could give them this statement. Verse 35, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that ye also have seen me, and here it is, folks, and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I am come down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will, which has sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing. And listen to the promise, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him, would you read the last phrase out loud with me? May have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Praise God, huh? So here's what I've determined, and I think you'll probably be with me. I'm going to be hungry again. I don't know how this food fellowship's going to go for you, but I love them. I love the gathering of God's people. I love the food that we share. And here's what I found. Whatever I eat today, I'm going to be hungry again. You with me? And you might look at this and say, well, how can that be hungry? I don't know. I'm storing up for days of leanness, okay? I'm going to last a lot longer than you skinny people. Uh, <laughs> don't get me started. The answer is the answer of a spiritual need. We need this bread from heaven. And that's the picture that we have in need and provision. There's always need. There's more need than this body can meet. There's more need than we could ever handle. And that need magnifies the idea that we're going to have to have help. And we have illustrations of that all over where God meets physical need, God meets physical need, He helps, He gives grace. He, he carries you. He draws you to him. But all those are just a picture of how Jesus is the one who's the bread of life that so satisfies the soul that it's a bread that we have never experienced physically. A bread that you could eat where you would never be hungry again. Now, by the way, as an exhibition of hungry, what happens when you're hungry and now you're hungry for an extended period of time? There is a disposition, especially amongst men, where hungry turns to something. Anybody know what that turns to? Hungry turns to hangry. It affects our disposition. And you're like, Pastor Jeff, a few more minutes, you're about ready to see it. <laughs> I'm just magnifying your need. <laughs> need in life points us to Jesus. It points us to the fact that we need him. And he has so met that need that when we partake of him, that when we come to him by faith, he so satisfies the soul that you'll never be hungry again. He uses the same illustration with water, that you'll never be thirsty again. He so satisfies the need as the God of heaven 
that all need is met. And this ought to start looking like Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I will have no need of want because he has provided everything. Now, who are we that the God of heaven should offer that to us? But here we sit with these promises in our hand, delivered to us, evidenced by the life of Jesus, proven by his resurrection, that what he says is so. And in the midst of a world that is angry, in the midst of a world that is shaking its fist in the face of God, he is still the provider in offering that provision to anyone that would come. So we're going to close this service with two major applications. One, if you're not saved here today, the invitation is still there for you. And your anger is misplaced. Your accusations are misplaced. Humble yourself and come to the God of the Bible, to his son, Jesus, and receive what he promises, not only salvation, but a promise of a future where all sin, sorrow, sickness, pain, and death are eradicated, where we have a home together with him forever. Come to the bread of life. Believer, you should give thanks for this provision that God has given. But I also want to remind us again as a church, we are partners together in ministry to the world around us. That's to the believers and the lost alike. And we certainly can't do it all. But I want to, with you, as a church family, to rise to the occasion that God has given us and to do what we can with the resources, time, and efforts that God has given us. You're not made like anybody else. You're just supposed to be you and serve God as he directs you. But I want you to know that God has called you to this partnership. And in that partnership, when we partner that way, guess who we look like? Jesus. And after all, isn't he the one that we're worshiping? Isn't he the one that we're following? This is a high calling of God in Christ Jesus.